Our next presentation um, will be by Zachary Schrag, who is an associate professor of history at George Mason University. He received his PhD in history from Columbia University in 2002. Um, he then taught at Columbia University, and in 2004, he came to Mason, earning tenure in 2009. His first book, The Great Society Subway, A History of the Washington Metro, examines the politics, planning, engineering, architecture, finance, and operations of the nation's second largest rail transit system, arguing that the metro is best understood as the concrete manifestation of great society ideals. One chapter describes the origins of Metro's famous underground station architecture, including the contentious role of the Commission of Fine Arts in shaping that design. His second book, Ethical Imperialism, Institutional Review Boards and the Social Sciences from 1965 to 2009 will be published in the fall of 2010. And he is currently working on a third book on the role of the National Guard in urban riots. His articles and essays have been published in the Journal of Policy History, the Journal of Urban History, Technology and Culture, Washington, and Washington History, and the Washington Post. He served as editor of Washington History and has received fellowships from the National Science Foundation, the Gerald Ford Foundation, and the Library of Congress. His talk today is entitled, Rather Strong Advisory, The 1960s and the Challenge of the FBI Building. Please welcome Zachary Schrag. Thank you. I'm uh, very honored to be here. Uh, as you heard, I first immersed myself in the history of the Commission of Fine Arts while writing the architecture chapter of my work on the Washington Metro. And in the course of that project, I learned of the extraordinary collection of talented people who were appointed to the commission by President John F. Kennedy and how they took part in an energetic debate about the future of Washington, D.C and federal architecture nationwide, extending some of the debates that we've heard about already today. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to revisit that period in the Commission's history, especially the period from 1963 to 1967, when the Commission consisted entirely of Kennedy appointees. I'd like to describe the fascinating membership of that period, trace its debates over one of the signature projects that came before it, this one above ground, rather than underground like the Metro. Now, uh, the FBI headquarters, which have been known since 1972 as the J. Edgar Hoover Building, should have been a proud achievement of Washington architecture in the 1960s. This was a federal office building commissioned not long after the president, President Kennedy, called for better federal office buildings. It occupied, and still does, occupy a prominent spot on Pennsylvania Avenue at a time when that avenue was the focus of national attention. And it had a big budget, $40 million at the start, $126 million spent on it by the end. Its ultimate tenant was to be one of the most powerful men in government, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. And understanding the project's importance, that remarkably talented commission of fine arts took almost three years deliberating over the design. As Chairman William Walton said in 1967, we have been on it longer than almost anything. Yet the end result of all of this money and hard work was a building that the AIA Guard to Ar Architecture of Washington calls a swaggering bully, ungainly, ill-mannered, and seemingly looking for trouble. Uh, critic Benjamin Forge called it a national symbol of the cold, the imperious, and the off-putting in federal architecture. J. Edgar Hoover himself is said to have called it the greatest monstrosity ever constructed in the history of Washington. Now, critic Wolf von Eckhart, uh, whose article appears here, had praised a preliminary design in 1964. But when the building opened in 1975, he called it alien to the spirit of the Capitol and the architecture of the avenue, a matter of heedless and needless quest for novelty for its own sake gone slightly berserk. And he continued, and this is key, I don't even blame the architects. I blame the Fine Arts Commission, which under the influence of Gordon Bunshaft tried so hard to make its imprint on Washington and Pennsylvania Avenue that it delivered a painful kick instead. Even the Commission of Fine Arts has had its own doubts. In 1986, Charles Atherton called the building eerie, uneasy, and disturbing, like a surrealistic Italian movie of 1960. 
he applauded a proposal by commission member Frederick Hart to transform the building's exterior with sculptural panels. And a letter writer to the Washington Post thought we could do even better than that with kinetic electronic billboards with computer generated sound effects, rat a tat tat. So, uh, the question is, how could the magnificent Commission of Fine Arts of the 1960s approve a design so bad that for the last four decades it has been almost universally condemned? Now, this may be an unfair question, I realize. Uh, as Sister Helen Prejean has said of death row inmates, we are worth more than the worst act we commit. And von Eckhart was probably not alone when he singled out the FBI building as the greatest mistake of Walton's commission. But I also think we learn more from our mistakes than from our successes. So tracing the history of the FBI building can tell us much about where the commission stood half a century after its founding and half a century ago. Because that building, as well as other federal buildings of the period, tells us what the commission had and what it lacked. Now the commission's chief asset of the period, and this echoes some of what you've heard before, was that valuable, indispensable resource for which so many in Washington compete clout. For the, unlike the commission that was let go by Harry Truman, the commission of the early 1960s could draw from that deepest of wells, the White House. Now, a few years ago, a columnist for Slate magazine claimed that neither Kennedy nor Johnson nor Nixon demonstrated any particular feeling for the built environment. And some of you may have heard of this columnist. Uh, I don't know. Um, I will grant uh, Johnson, so long as we are talking about Lyndon Johnson and not Lady Bird. Um, I will grant Nixon, uh, though at one point he listened very carefully to a proposal for a Nixon National Park in Prince George's County. Uh, but I cannot grant John F. Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy, as his friend and neighbor William Walton noted, had lived in Washington most of his adult life. He knew the streets, the parks, the surrounding countryside. As a senator, he helped sponsor legislation to preserve historic buildings in Lafayette Square. And that interest continued after his ascent to the presidency. At one point, for example, while he was supposed to be taking a nap, Jackie Kennedy found him in his underwear, playing on the floor with a model of Lafayette Square. One of the last requests he made before leaving on his fateful trip to Dallas in November 1963 was that another model, this one of Pennsylvania Avenue, be set up in the West Wing for him to study on his return. His personal involvement led Architectural Forum in its January 1963 special issue on Washington to conclude that Kennedy had taken more interest in the face of the Capitol than any president since Jefferson. Now, of course, the president could not devote too much of his own time to questions of architecture, but he did lend the prestige of his office to those who would do the actual work of rebuilding Washington. One was Daniel Patrick Moynihan, whom Professor Rubczynski rightly credits as an important force for architecture within the administration. But there were several others as well. In 1961, August Heckscher was appointed as the first special consultant on the arts. He took pride in pointing out that architecture and city planning were as much part of national culture as the performing arts. And he discussed both topics with President Kennedy. Carl Yasko, Assistant Commissioner for Design and Construction of the Public Building Service of the General Services Administration, proved himself a proponent of modernism in federal architecture. Another key player was Jacqueline Kennedy, seen here with John Carl Warnicke, uh, famous for redecorating the White House, an act that she considered one of historic preservation. And she played less public but still important roles on Lafayette Square and later Pennsylvania Avenue and the Kennedy Center. Now, for our purposes today, two of Kennedy's personal friends stand out. One was William Walton, shown here with the President and First Lady in a cartoon from that Architectural Forum special issue. We'll see a couple more of those. Uh, Walton was a journalist, a painter, a Georgetown resident, and in 1960, a key Kennedy campaign aide who helped him win the West Virginia primary. After the inauguration, he became Kennedy's unofficial advisor on architecture. A second friend? was John Carl Warnicke, who died, unfortunately, just last month. Um, Kennedy had met him briefly in the early 1940s, but the two reconnected after their mutual friend, Paul Fay, helped Warnicke crash a White House cocktail party. And that led to a commission to take over the redesign of Lafayette Square. Like Walton, Warnicke was impressed by Kennedy's concern for architecture. He really loved architecture, Warnicke recalled decades later. He loved to talk about it. He couldn't conceive that I could know so much about a building that I was in charge of designing. Now, for a president interested in architecture, 
A natural target was the Commission of Fine Arts, which, despite Finley's work, had by the early 1960s gained a reputation for stodginess. And again, Architectural Forum, uh, the term causes even the stoutest modernist to tremble, uh, the misunderstood, misguided Commission of Fine Arts. Um, because of Truman's actions 12 years earlier, it sort of set up this echo effect where a bunch of members would have their terms expire all at once. So Kennedy appointed Hideo Sasaki um, earlier in the term, and then basically the rest of the commission, six members, uh, all expired. And rather than reappoint them, Kennedy uh, replaced the whole commission as Truman had before. Um, so naturally, he appointed uh, William Walton, his friend, as the chairman, and Warnicke as a member. Uh, another key appointment was Gordon Bunshaft, uh, shown here without a pipe, and maybe the only photo without a pipe. Um, he was less prominent than another architectural candidate, Philip Johnson, but unlike Johnson, he had not traveled to Nazi-occupied Poland and was therefore a safer political choice. Architectural critic Aline Saarinen was appointed in part to meet Jacqueline Kennedy's wish for a woman to join the commission, um, and it was very much then a Kennedy commission. And uh, Saarinen identified herself as a layperson, though of course that was not, uh, as an architectural critic, she was much more professionally involved in architecture than uh, later lay members. Uh, Kennedy also appointed sculptor Theodore Rozak and landscape architect Burnham Kelly. Uh, like Sasaki, they tended to defer to the others when discussing federal architects, architecture, so they play less of an important role here. And I believe that was part of Walton's idea of the chairmanship was to divide up responsibilities. Now, Kennedy, of course, uh, was killed that November, but the commission retained the prestige and self-confidence -confident of Camelot. Uh, part of that was because Walton was personally close to Lady Bird Johnson, and also Lyndon Johnson uh, wanted as much continuity as possible after the assassination. So for example, he retained Kennedy's advisor on national capital affairs, Charles Horsky, um, who had also advised uh, Kennedy on architectural matters. So it remained a commission with clout. Commenting in 1965 on the multiplicity of agencies involved in approving buildings, Walton exclaimed, I want to make it clear that this is the only one with any current legal authority on these designs. When he was informed that, in fact, his commission had less legal authority than the planning commission, he was unfazed. Well, as long as we have the district commissioners backing us, ours is rather strong advisory. Now, part of sustaining that power was trying to do, give good advice. Uh, as Tarleton, Charles Atherton told me, when you're advisory only, you have to make sure it is good advice because otherwise people will ignore you and you will lose power. So Kennedy's commission worked hard to do that good advice. But there's also a fine line between a confident commission and an overconfident commission, and many would say that Walton's group often crossed that line. Uh, this was an assertive commission willing to state their positions bluntly and forcefully rather than deferring to the architects before them. And uh, perhaps the most prominent example is, again, the Metro, uh, where I showed in my work how the commission ignored Harry Weiss's desire for the maximum volume possible for each soil condition, and instead uh, wanted their own more abstract concepts of what subway stations should be. The commission insisted that Weiss revert to a preliminary design for his stations, dramatically reshaping what has become one of Washington's most recognizable works of architecture. And that intervention was extreme, uh, really reshaping the downtown stations, but does represent the belief of the commissioners, uh, particularly Gordon Bunshaft and Aline Saarinen, that they best serve the nation by speaking freely and flexing whatever powers in an, an advisory commission could muster. Speaking of the US tax court in 1965, Bunshaft boasted, we really laced into Lundy, and I've talked to several friends of mine about Lundy, and they say he needs it. Aline Saarinen concurred. I was very brutal, but I meant every word of it, and I'm glad, because this is infinitely better. Now, if you go back to the commission's history, it might have surprised its founders to learn that their successors of the 1960s would spend so much of their time talking about office buildings. Public buildings in the District of Columbia were added to the commission's mandate as something of an afterthought. So the reason we are here in May of 2010 is because this is the 100th anniversary of the passage of an act of Congress establishing the commission to advise on statues, fountains, and monuments. It took another five months until October of 1910 for President Taft to sign an executive order adding public buildings to the charge. And in other decades, as you've heard, 
the Commission's most prominent decisions concerned statues, monuments, and museums, or historic works uh, like the White House itself. But in the 1960s, the action was in office buildings for two reasons. The first was practical. The federal government needed more space. It had, of course, expanded dramatically during and after World War II uh, without expanding its physical plant to keep pace. In 1962, the Ad Hoc Committee on Federal Office Space, again appointed by Kennedy, found that more than 50,000 federal employees in the Washington area worked in crowded, poorly lit, poorly ventilated, obsolete, or temporary buildings. Uh, here's one of the famous tempos on the mall, the last one, the Navy and Munitions Building. And if you want to see one of the office buildings that was considered obsolete in 1962, uh, look around you. This, of course, was still occupied by office workers. Already there was talk of converting the building to a museum. Uh, moreover, uh, departments and agencies were scattered among multiple sites, making administration difficult. In an effort to upgrade federal workspace, the General Services Administration launched an ambitious 10-year plan to build 8.7 million square feet of new office space. So one reason was practical. The second reason was cultural. To go back to my favorite issue of Architectural Forum, um, in the 1950s, Washington had become known for second-rate architecture. As William Walton lamented, the less said, the better, about the buildings of the first post-war decades. The vast, ill-planned State Department addition. The cold marble Federal Aviation Building at the bottom there. The tasteless office building next door. No administration will ever point with pride at these exercises in construction without principle. A retired general in the White House spread a mantle of mediocrity and middle age over the city. And to address this problem, Daniel Patrick Moynihan included in the office space report the famous guiding principles for federal architecture. The design of federal office buildings, particularly those to be located in the nation's capital, said the principles, must meet a twofold requirement. First, it must provide efficient and economical facilities for the use of government agencies. Second, it must provide visual testimony to the dignity, enterprise, vigor, and stability of the American government. And actually, there was a threefold requirement in that the report also urged that the development of an official style must be avoided. I love the word vigor in there. I figure that's the Kennedy influence. Um, these requirements were difficult to reconcile, for visual testimony is not necessarily efficient or economical. So we've heard a lot today about the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial designed to offer visual testimony, but not designed to provide workspace for any federal employees. Um, the temporary buildings still cluttering the mall in the 1960s were certainly economical, but if they testified to the stability of government, it was an inertia of federal government rather than the kind of stability that the ad hoc committee had in mind. So throughout the 1960s, uh, the Commission of Fine Arts, along with the rest of Washington, struggled to balance function and design. Now this could be done, and in some ways the most important member of the Commission in this effort was the ghost of Eero Saarinen, Aline Saarinen's late husband. Two of his commissions, the Dulles Airport Terminal and the U.S. Chancery in London, were widely regarded as exemplars of federal architecture. They combined some classical symmetry with formality and modern simplicity. Moreover, several of the commissioners had personal connections to the late architect. Aline Saarinen, William Walton, and Gordon Bunshaft had served together on an advisory board to help complete the furnishing of Dulles Airport, and Rozak, another appointment, had worked with Arrow on a chapel at MIT and at the US Chancery in London. Warnicke had considered Arrow to be a role model and a friend. So Gordon Bunshaft, who, uh, as you probably know, was the most assertive commissioner on matters of architecture, had two favorite words that could apply to Saarinen's designs, strong and simple. When an applicant told him that a tight budget had forced a simple structural system, Bunshaft remarked, I think the structural system is so simple and strong, it's kind of nice there were some economic problems. Another favorite word was solid. Bad words for Bunshaft and Aline Saarinen included decorative, wallpaper, and the worst insult of all, fussy. 
Now, Warnicke, it should be said, had a more nuanced version of modernism. Uh, coming from the West Coast, he was influenced by William Worcester and other regional modernists who believed that modern forms could be integrated into geographical and regional contexts. So at Stanford, for example, Warnicke designed buildings that had precast concrete and modern arches below, but also traditional red tile roofs above. Not only would these respect the past, he believed, but they would also last far longer than orthodox modern flat roofs. In contrast, he disapproved of Bunshaft's Beinecke Library at Yale, which he thought was uh, worked rather poorly with the Gothic courtyard there. But both could agree on arrow-like designs. So the commission wanted buildings that combined classicism and modernism. When a senator complained that Warnicke's new executive office building looked like a big red barn and suggested that all federal buildings should have a federal style, Warnicke, or Walton politely disagreed. He reminded the senator, the construction costs of something like the Federal Triangle are monumental if you do it today. And he suggested, the buildings of L'Enfant Plaza formed the 1960s equivalent of the Federal Triangle. Walton explained, I would think that those buildings were rather harmonious, even though they are not of identical styles. The materials that have been chosen go together pretty well. They are obviously not all by the same hand, which in a way I think you are recommending almost that the same hand design all the buildings. The argument was persuasive. Yes, said the senator, I think so too. So in quest of this harmony, the commission insisted that architects take account of Washington's existing architecture. Um, and so this plays up what uh, Professor Westfall was saying about this question of should federal architecture be fashionable or should it be classical? Uh, the commission of the 1960s believed that um, the ideal building would be both. So in 1965, for example, uh, the commission forcefully expressed this vision in a letter rejecting Victor Lundy's first proposed design for the U.S. tax court. Uh, you can see how it sort of curves up there. That was designed to provide shave, uh, shade. It also looks vaguely like a very large personal grooming device, but um, that's what Lundy came up with. Walton accused Lundy of a deliberate attempt to strike out into an area of his own personal expression with little reference to the traditions of Washington. This approach may be justified in some cities, but not here. Obviously, we're not saying that tradition has to be interpreted literally in design, but there are certain elements, classic in nature, that have become common to the roots of the plan and development of the city over a long period of time. Under no circumstances could we ever accept the architect's arguments for a departure from these general principles. Lundy went back to the drawing board and came back with a design that the commission loved, uh, more formal, more classical, uh, pretty much what you get today, a widely admired building of the period. Now, unfortunately, vision, like clout, can do harm as well as good. And for its, in its quest for firmness and delight, the commission could, I fear, lose sight of commodity. A striking example concerned federal office building number five, known today as the Forrestal Building. As is well known, the Forrestal Building blocks the visual connection between the 10th Street Mall and the Smithsonian Castle. Uh, you can't blame that on Walton's commission. The previous commission had approved the basic scheme in 1962, and Congress authorized the bridging of 10th Street non long after that. It may be worth noting, however, that Bunshaft did think this was better than having two long, built, taller buildings uh, flanking uh, a 10th Street Mall that would create what he uh, thought was something too tunnel like. A more interesting dispute for our purposes concerned the rear block building to the right of this image. Now the architect, Nathaniel Curtis, had the idea that the exterior walls should be as opaque as possible, in part to contrast with the front block of the building along Independence Avenue on the left. He was supported before the Fine Arts Commission by Bunshaft and Saarinen. Bunshaft argued on the grounds of aesthetics. I think that plan makes sense without windows and I think it ought to be without windows and ought to look like a structural wall. And of course, this is the architect of the Hirshhorn, um, didn't like windows very much. Uh, Aline Saarinen agreed, extolling artificial lighting and ventilation, which she claimed met the needs of many corporate employees. Making the case for exterior windows, and there was going to be a courtyard with interior windows, uh, making the case for windows on the outside was the tenant, the Department of Defense. We feel our people are entitled to or would be much more happy and work in a better environment if they had natural light coming in, its representatives told the commission. 
Uh, and Warnicke was uh, sympathetic to this. He uh, wanted to subordinate the pure design aesthetic view of a windowless exterior to the concerns of the people who are going to work there for the next 70 or 80 years. And in the end, the two factions compromised, permitting windows on two of the block's four sides. So along with its clout and its vision, the Commission of Fine Arts was defined what it didn't, by what it didn't have, uh, city planners. Uh, now, of course, this was not a formal exclusion. There's no reason to think that a city planner could not be a well-qualified judge of the fine arts. In practice, though, those appointed to the commission, as you've heard, tended to replicate the interests of the Macmillan Commission of 1901, architecture, landscape architecture, or sculpture. And the split between architecture and planning as you just heard, was reinforced in 1926 when the National Capital Park Commission became the National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And in 1952, it was renamed the National Capital Planning Commission and given additional powers. From then on, the two commissions would each have some responsibility over federal buildings in Washington, with the Commission of Fine Arts responsible for the buildings and the Planning Commission responsible for the site. As Walton told Congress in 1969, our voice should be in the design of the building, theirs in the use of the land. And just to give you a visual representation, this is the full cartoon from the uh, architectural forum showing a very crowded Washington landscape with all sorts of different agencies fighting over turf. Um, in practice, this was not an easy division. Uh, I think one could say it was even unworkable. And by the 1960s, the Fine Arts Commission and the Planning Commission had formed something of a rivalry. Walton complained that the planning commissioners often try to perform our functions. Bunshaft agreed, noting of the NCPC, the commission is on planning, not on architecture. And when the architects on Federal Office Building 5 added those windows in part in response to NCPC concerns, Bunshaft angrily exclaimed, I don't see what the planning commission has to do with the exterior skin. On the other hand, the Commission of Fine Arts had no hesitation in discussing at some length issues of planning, as when they debated whether the area north of the Capitol should consist exclusively of federal buildings or include private commercial buildings as well. Nor should there have been this firm division between building and land. Walt Warnicke in particular understood that a well-designed building could fail in the wrong site. As much as you admire the scale and detail of the federal triangle, he later said, boy, those are cold potatoes. And if we were to look at the greatest achievement of the Commission of Fine Arts of this era, we might well include the relocation of the Labor Department and the Tax Court to their present locations, which were basically planning decisions rather than skin architecture decisions. So ideally then, the Fine Arts Commissioners should have collaborated with the Planning Commissioners. Um, and maybe Truman's idea for merging the two bodies would have been a rather good one. As it happened, the two commissions lacked respect for each other. Unlike the seven well-qualified judges of the fine arts whose only loyalty was to their own aesthetics, the planning commissions, commissioners included representatives from various federal bodies, uh, making it a more pragmatic and political body. They are a bunch of lay people, and some of them are political, said Bunshaft. Walton agreed. The membership is terrible. Nor did the planning commission always admire the arts commissioners. When FOB 5 came up for review there, the commission tried to make the front portion of the building thinner to admit more light. And when it was told that the CFA wanted no exterior windows on the rear block, members of the planning commission asked if the fine arts commissioners wanted people to work in the dark and warned that a windowless block would resemble Lubyanka prison. Um, this, of course, is unfair. Lubyanka prison does have windows on the exterior. Um, and, and even though the Planning Commission basically won that one, getting the windows on two sides, uh, for months later at their meetings, they made fun of the General Services Administration and the Fine Arts Commissioners uh, on that basis. So uh, we have a commission of fine arts that combined political clout, a taste for solidity, simplicity, and hints of classicism, and a disregard for the National Pl Capital Planning Commission, which was returned. And the result of this combination was, I'm afraid, the FBI building. OK, this is the site of the FBI building uh, as it appeared in the early 1960s uh, in the first report of the Pennsylvania Avenue Commission. Uh, that commission was created in 1962 by the same uh, 
uh, report on federal office space that did the guiding principles. Uh, it was founded under architect Nat Owens and given the task of redesigning what was considered the shoddy northern side of the famous street. Uh, these days we might look at those buildings and say, wow, let's, let's preserve them, but um, not in 1962. Uh, officially, the President's Council on Pennsylvania Avenue reported to the National Capital Planning Commission. Unofficially, there was some tension between the two groups. So, and of course, I should say the Planning Commission was divided between the public members, that is, people just appointed for their own knowledge, and the ex officio members from the various agencies. So, um, along with its tenant, the FBI, its client, the General Services Administration, its funder, Congress, the FBI, would have to, the FBI building would have to please three separate commissions, the Planning Commission, the Fine Arts Commission, and the Pennsylvania Avenue Commissions, all of which had their own divisions within them. Now, there were various overlapping memberships. Walton, for example, was on the Pennsylvania Avenue Commission. There were various staff liaison positions. There were some joint meetings. But each commission re remained somewhat jealous of its turf and suspicious of the others. As architect Carter Manny of the FBI building complained in 1965, there are so many bases that have to be touched on this thing. This has been frustrating. Now, the Pennsylvania Avenue Commission wanted to humanize what it knew would be an imposing building. As early as July 1963, its staff architects were fretting that a 2.2 million square foot building would ruin the avenue no matter what. Uh, but J. Edgar Hoover had insisted on remaining across Pennsylvania Avenue from the Justice Department, where his nominal boss, the Attorney General, worked. And believe it or not, J. Edgar Hoover had even more clout than the Commission of Fine Arts. So to compensate, the Pennsylvania Avenue Commission suggested a symbolic FBI building along Pennsylvania Avenue, backed by a taller, more prosaic part to the north that would house clerical operations. Nat Owings also quickly rejected a proposal from architect Stan Gladich to build a rectangular Miesian building. He very much wanted to emphasize the diagonal of Pennsylvania Avenue. Equally importantly, the Pennsylvania Avenue Commission stressed circulation. It wanted an FBI building that would welcome public circulation from north to south and to serve as a balcony for viewing parades along Pennsylvania Avenue. It wanted the first floor of the building set back at least 10 feet to, from the front column line in order to pr provide a portion of the arcade that was supposed to run the length of the north side of the avenue. As Owings put it, I would like to have it as, as open through there as we can possibly get. Now one problem with openness was that the building was supposed to house J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, an agency born from the bombings of the 19-teens and 20s, an agency full of secrets. Uh, yes, the FBI was happy to provide tours, but it also wanted some physical barriers against attack. Not just a plinth two or three feet high, the Bureau wanted a moat. Openings and railings for public access were only acceptable when lockable gates could be thrown across them. A bigger problem with this open scheme was the Commission of Fine Arts. As a group, it proved uninterested in Owings' wishes for an arcade along the avenue or circulation through the building. What mattered to it were proportions and contrast, not a continuous arcade. Bunshaft termed the Pennsylvania Avenue Commission concept for the birds when you get right down to it. When you have all this walk, all the sidewalk in front, he asked, what the hell do you need Lodge in there for? The commissioners did care about Pennsylvania Avenue, and at one point they objected to what they called a particularly oppressive treatment of the base of the building. But in the end, they came down firmly on the side of solidity rather than openness for the Pennsylvania face of the building. The base of the main terrace for adjoining Pennsylvania Avenue should be treated as a solid mass um, with only one major penetration for the entranceway, they resolved. To incorporate glassed-in store areas or exhibition spaces along the sidewalk would completely deny the structural purpose of the base and as a result, give a superficial character to the, to the design. Their only dispute was about who would have to break the news to Nat Owings. Now, the Commission's dismissal of the planners' hopes for continuous arcade leads me to wonder if the Commission of the 1960s embodied planning concerns as much as Daniel Burnham might have wished. It not only lacked planners, but it lacked architects who were as interested in planning as some, oops, as some others of the period. For example, uh, Harry Weiss, who had been considered for a spot on the Commission, I think, 
was a little more interested in circulation, or Chloe Thiel Woodard Smith, who joined the commission in late 1967 after the major decisions on the FBI had been completed, I think either one of those would have been a little more sensitive uh, than someone like Gordon Bunshaft. When Bunshaft and Saarinen uh, did talk about avenues and looked at models uh, showing a broader section of Washington than just the building they were reviewing, but I'm not persuaded that either one of them had a good feeling for Washington and for the people who moved through it. Yet, thanks to the Kennedy clout, they won the day. Some of the portions or the elements of the building that are considered flaws today could be read and were read as virtues. So one of the chief criticisms of the building in recent years has been its solidity. In 2009, for example, architectural columnist Roger Lewis complained of the massive building's hard-edged, fortress-like image and its opacity at street level. He claimed that aesthetic concerns were voiced but ignored. But the thing to remember is that for the Commission of Fine Arts of the 1960s, and for Bunshaft in particular, opacity was an aesthetic concern and a positive good. Reviewing the FBI proposals, Bunshaft repeated his basic vocabulary. Why does it wiggle around each lump? He demanded of one detail. Why does this wall have to go in like that? And in a line that he could have used for just about any project he reviewed, that he could have rubber stamped on the proposals, why can't it just be a strong, simple thing? From the beginning, the commissioners liked the vast forms. The first presentation in October of 1964 ended with Chairman William Walton telling the, de the designers that we are pleased by the approach and very excited by it, and all those words we tell you when we're happy. By late 1965, Bunshaft remarked of the FBI building that it's marvelous, and it shows how wonderful it is when we can participate in the various rough studies. Rather than reconsideration, he offered only minor changes. And there's dialogue all like this all throughout the transcripts. I think the proportions of all this sort of thing, indicating on model, are wonderful. I don't like that, indicating, but I think this is kind of clumsy for this, indicating. This ought to be bigger and this ought to be smaller, indicating. But he did not demand any drastic changes from the building uh, the way he had for Harry Weiss's Metro or for Victor Lundy's tax court. Indeed, his vision was so close to that of the building's architects, Carter Manny and Stan Gladich, that they considered their Bunshaft their champion against Nat Owings and his demand for an arcade. The fact that it was, after all, a building for the FBI only encouraged Bunshaft to expound on the virtues of solidity. The general principle around here could be solid as a sense of security, he argued. I think personally it would be wonderful if the FBI looked kind of closed in. And you'll be aware it's FBI, not Department of Agriculture. When the architects proposed their moat, Bunshaft helpfully suggested adding snakes. Now, when the design came before the National Capital Planning Commission in September of 1967, FBI spokesmen muddied the water by claiming the Bureau objected to the arcades on the grounds that there would be muggings, the undesirables would congregate there. Charles Atherton had to assure a senator that whatever the FBI thought, the decision had been made purely on aesthetic grounds. If a critic like Lewis had told Bunshaft the building looked hard-edged, he would have regarded it, I think, as a compliment. For all its monstrosity, the FBI building does express some of the aesthetic values of the Walton Commission. Now, once the building got going, uh, the Commission of Fine Arts began distancing itself from the project. By 1969, Walton was telling Congress, we are happy with it as far as the design goes, but we are all scared of the size of it. It is a blockbuster. And the symbolism of putting this size building for the FBI right in the heart of the city is terrible. And indeed, it is not a beautiful building. And no reading of the Commission of Fine Arts transcripts will make it so. Nor, however, is it a mediocre building. As Ada Louise Huxtable wrote in 1972, it will look like a modern dinosaur. Washington is the great architectural boneyard. But it could be a lot worse. It could have looked like the Rayburn building. So we have something that is strong, solid, intimidating, offensive, and eerie, but it is not boring, and it is not mediocre. 
I think it's fair to say that the FBI building lacks the grace of Breuer's HUD and HEW buildings or Lundy's tax court. But it does share some of their spirit of simplicity, solidity, distinctiveness. Faced with a difficult, perhaps impossible program of housing an enormous agency like the FBI with all of its files on all of you, uh, in downtown Washington, its designers did create something impressive. And that was in thanks, in part, to the assertive commission of fine arts of the 1960s. So that commission left us not only the building, but also a guide to appreciating the building for what it is, its flaws and its virtues alike. In the project files and the transcripts of the commission, we can find a vision for federal architecture. We may disagree with that vision, but we can still learn from it. Half a century later, there's even something charming about being harangued by Gordon Bunshaft. Ultimately, though, the commission of the 1960s consisted of an extremely talented set of people who did not always fit easily into the constraints of the commission's structure, who struggled to reconcile the grandeur of their vision with the limits of their power. While sometimes helpful, they were too often perceived by designers and by other government bodies as an obstacle rather than a partner in the design process. And I know this is anachronistic, but I must skip ahead to a very different approach employed today. Uh, in 2009, rather than maintaining that rivalry with the National Capital Planning Commission, today's commission joined to produce, with the Planning Commission to produce the Monumental Core Framework Plan. And in their boldest proposal, the two commissions working together took a fresh look at the FBI building and decided that the best thing to do would be to demolish it and replace it with several smaller federal buildings north of a reestablished D Street with a museum between D Street and Pennsylvania Avenue. So today, as in the 1960s, the FBI building tells us something about the Commission of Fine Arts. I would like to think that its collaboration with the NCPC suggests that today's commission has a better sense of its place in Washington, both as a city and as a power structure. And if that's right, then the commission's lasting monument may someday be the absence of the FBI building. Thank you.